Well, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, if I can all ask you to take your seats. I hope you enjoyed the, cafe, the, the coffee and croissants and the networking. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first panel discussion of the day here in our Made in Asia conference. Um, led by none other than Al Adam Salsa, Managing Director for PW Consulting. They're, uh, uh, they're actually quite a good accounting firm, so I believe. <laughs> um, but Adam is, I'm sure, um, going to take us through a very interesting 60 minutes with a focus on some of the HR issues. And in fact, the title of this panel is How Human Factors Shape Traditional Sourcing Models. Um, and Adam is another Aussie, um, and in fact, if you look at his bio details, it says here, Adam has been named as one of the top 20 most influential Australians in Asia by the Business Review Weekly. Um, I'm sure with his 20 years of experience, he has got a great deal of insights to share with us. Um, he has, in fact, he's an economist, um, but he has had 20 years of experience in very high level HR level strategic consulting work across the region. He's worked in Beijing, he's worked uh, in Tokyo, and of course uh, now based here in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm sure uh, he's going to run a very enjoyable panel for us. And he's also joined, just in terms of nationalities, uh, by um, a Hong Kong gentleman by a British lady, um, a German, our first German, ladies and gentlemen, and our first American. So please, no booing. <laughs> but I know another very international panel. I'm looking forward to it. Adam, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is only 60 minutes and we've got a very wide canvas to cover. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, use the time as efficiently as possible. Well, I'll ask my colleagues to introduce themselves briefly. You do have our details in your booklet, so you won't repeat what's there, but just to give you a bit of context. And then to share with you some issues that we see as, as of interest um, as discussion starters. And then move where we can to uh, questions and answers so that you'll actually know where people are coming from. And so uh, when we go to the questions and answers, we'll take two or three questions at a time and then pass them to, to the moderators, uh, to, the, to the participants. What we do have is immense depth here up on stage as a resource for you to ask us questions uh, from many different sites, not just different nationalities. Um, and so we get to go quite wide and then it's over to you to then take us down in those areas you want to go to in more depth. So that's where we're going to shape this. Um, so uh, to start off with, I'm actually going to ask uh, Veit Geiser, Veit as in fight. Yeah, I was informed. Uh, Veit as in fight. Um, uh, Veit, can you just open up and just share with us where you're coming from? Okay, um, I'm the VP sourcing for VF Asia, and I'm responsible for several of our American brands. Uh, one uh, Italian brand, Napa Piri, which is an outdoor brand, and I handle all the matters for all the regional offices that the Asia um, maintains here in Asia. So um, I'd like to share with you my views on, on labor trends and where labor is coming from and where labor is going to. If you look into the future, it's mm, the best thing to look quickly into the past and say, where have we been with labor? And when I look into my past, we really never made sourcing decisions based on labor in the past. It was the sourcing decisions were usually um, influenced by quota. Wherever quota was available, you would go with your business. And wherever quota was available, labor would be shipped to. So labor was exchangeable. Labor was available in abundance, especially the Chinese labor that was moved to places like Saipan. Um, it was cheap and it was willing to endure hardships when you look at some of the dormitories that I have seen in my life, nothing you want to really recommend to somebody. So, labor has been pretty um, tough. We've dealt with labor in a pretty tough way in the past and we never really considered labor to be a driver.
driving factor of our decisions. 2005 code I've known what happened. Actually, it's concentrating on a very few countries, and I brought some numbers here. If I take the top 12 sourcing countries, and I look at the U.S. apparel imports, and forgive me for being a little U.S. standard, that's the BF thing. So um, the U.S. apparel import, I think for Europe, we pretty much see the same numbers. 45% of the total U.S. apparel imports were shared among the top 12 sourcing countries, which pretty much include every country that we own business in. That was in 2000. 2005, with the fall of quota, that went up to 60%. Today, we're at 75%. So those 12 countries share 75% of the sourcing volume. And within those countries are countries like South Korea and Hong Kong, which are basically meaningless today. So you see the concentration um, on sourcing ground, which actually leaves us with much less options than we've ever had. The quota was bad enough, I know we've all been complaining about quota when we had it, but it created sourcing opportunities in countries where you would normally not source in. So now we're back to, we need to go to countries that are competitive and where we can source in. And what do we see in those countries, basically? We're seeing uh, a lot of inflation in those countries. We see Bangladesh with a labor cost to factory of around $90 if you take a, 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 a serial, um, experienced the sewing operator. And you see China with $450, everybody else is somewhere in between there. And our challenge going forward, I think, is to get more out of existing factories because we can't migrate to cost mitigate any further. In the past, to cost mitigate, we've been migrating our business to the next country, to the next country, it's over. Where, where else do we want to go after Bangladesh? So Burma may be coming up, but who knows how much is really in Burma, right? How much meat is at the bottom there? So, to get more out of facilities, you can do two ways, I think. One is that, forgive me, I'm not trying to be funny here, but it's that what I call all the Chinese approach, which is let your labor work two hours more. So then you get more out of them. So I think that's not appropriate. But that's not the solution for us to go forward. It's not workable, not sustainable. It's not compliant and not desirable. So what's the other way to get more out of your same facility and your same labor it's basically motivation. Try to motivate, and I think that's where our industry it will be challenged in the future. How do we motivate labor? How do we make ourselves more attractive? When you go to most of the garment factories today, you don't want to spend more than an hour in that factory. So how do we make these places more attractive? How do we get more automation? How do we make it more sexy for people, for engineering people, to, to um, enjoy the garment industry and enjoy technology in the garment industry? Give you a little example. We're running about 20 factories in Mexico, producing uh, around about 100 million pair of jeans a year. So that's a pretty sizable operation. We have that in Mexico, and I'm competing every year. I'm supposed to, or I'm, I'm asked and challenged to compete with Mexico on basic five pocket programs. I can't beat these guys. I can't beat them out of Bangladesh. And simply why? Their, their labor cost is $550 a month, so it's expensive. So they work in a country like Mexico, which is not known as the most productive country, actually, the Manana culture and everything, I mean, we all know about that, right? But Cancun and everything is easy going, so it's not really known as a, as a power, powerhouse for efficiency. Still, they produce genes three to four times faster than I can in my fastest factory here in Asia. And, and why is that? Because they've done a lot of measures on HR and the motivation to bring stuff up, and I think that's our challenge for the future. Sorry. Okay, no, no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. So that's a, a, an overview. Life is different now in the future where we're going with our labor um, throughout Asia. Um, Sunny, can you talk about different locations within Asia and some of those areas and stuff? A quick introduction. Thanks. Um, brief introduction, Sunny Ten here, um, executive director of Movement Tech Holdings. Um, we have about a billion dollars um, manufacturing business with mostly in apparel. And for the past few years, we branched up into computer bags and litter bags. Um, in terms of um, locations of our productions, we do operate in China, and we are moving outside of China. We are operating in the Indonesia, we are in the Philippines. Uh, we're trading business in Bangladesh, we're in India, in Indonesia. Um, in terms of countries, um, as a manufacturer, we are looking at a few things. One thing is uh, the customer. 
uh, we cannot go where customer would not want us to go. So um, we try to partner with our customers to decide which is the best place. We are evaluating our capabilities, our relationships uh, in the countries whether we can offer it or not. I mean, the numbers may make sense, but when we go in there, maybe the local government relationship, the labor union, um, maybe the logistics, you cannot get it right, uh, supply chain. So these are the criteria that we're looking at. Um, then when we're looking at all these things, I also pull up just one or two numbers. Um, we talk about um, labor costs, but we also look at population. Uh, of course, we all know that 1.3 billion for China, but a lot of people talk about um, Vietnam, it's about 90 million. Uh, Cambodia, 14. Philippines, uh, 103 million. Uh, the reason we brought out Philippines is because we spent a lot of time in the Philippines, which is quite neglected. Um, and the average age, median, um, China is at 35. Um, years old. Uh, global average median is um, 28, um, Vietnam 27, India 25, uh, Philippines 22, Cambodia 22 too. So what we're trying to say is uh, we also need um, enough workers. We want to have younger workers to work with us more energetic. So these are also the consideration. Uh, when we talk about China, we do not say that we don't want to be in China, but we need a different business model. For example, how do we make the factory more efficient? Uh, on the labor side, the incentives, the training, technology, our innovation centers for each of business units, um, as well as how do we work on lead times? I mean, I'm, I'm sure from uh, right, it's not just about price, but also lead time. So which are the products that will fit for the country, like China, for servicing the brand? Um, and also, if we're working with outside of China, then how do we come up with the right supply chain so that you know, we can convince the brand to do it right with us? Great. Uh, just, just, just one follow-on question, just in terms of that, Sunny. So, how do you find in the whole area of turnover and factory turnover of staff, retaining staff in your factories that side? Of in fact, in China, the turnover is relatively high. In terms of business unit, I would say maybe around like five percent or so, plus minus. Uh, but in the Philippines, surprisingly, um, it's very low. So um, the workers are also very flexible. Sometimes there's a uh, low season. The, the, some of the workers will choose that, okay, for that period of time, they will say, I spend more time at home. When the season comes, I come back and work. Um, so it's a little bit different. So the cultural side also helps us in the Philippines. Thank you very much. Um, Ian, can I sort of... Uh, past you some, again, the things that are starting to come through are dealing with this higher cost. Uh, you've been on the front line of some of the uh, real labor areas. I'd like to just share that with you again. Introduce yourself briefly. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'm Ian Spalding. I run a company called Impact Global Partners, where a company works in China, four offices, 55 staff, doing what we call capacity building. But it's actually not auditing. It's helping factories to improve on some of their turnover challenges they might have, or through the research practices, or productivity. And I think I certainly have experience in the garment business, but maybe I'll just talk a little bit about electronics. Um, we just happen to have done the largest worker survey uh, ever conducted in recent memory. Uh, 35,000 workers we surveyed, and, and workers from a variety of different provinces, all working in the electronics sector. Uh, what we learned in that survey is a little bit as to why workers are leaving. And 5% turnover in China is actually a very good number. That's 5% per month. Uh, typical electronic factories are 10 to 15% per month. Uh, and when, you, when you're really trying to run a business and your HR department is trying to recruit such a huge number of workers and to try and orient them or train them, and we have very high numbers leaving every month, uh, it does create some challenges. And I think one of the, uh, the issues is, of course, can an HR department in a factory really be an HR department, or are they just recruiting? all day long. And uh, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle that I've seen, uh, if, if you really analyze it, because factories are sort of trying to deal with this labor migration um, uh, structural issue, particularly in the coastal provinces. And as a result, they've really de-skilled a lot of the jobs. Um, so if you actually are on a production line uh, you know, in a typical electronics factory, it, it really is quite mundane and, and, and not very interesting. Very different from garment factories, believe it or not where if you're in a sewing machine, you could learn different skills, and their styles change, and uh, there are actually things that might be more appealing to, to an employee. Um, but with that de-skilling of the production line process, 
it allows these factories to be able to get workers in, train them in one hour, two hours on the machine, and then allow them to be productive. Uh, and um, what that unfortunately has done is create very boring jobs that are not really all that much fun for workers, and driving some of the, uh, the angst uh, that workers are expressing, uh, why they want to leave the factory, or why they want to look for an alternative job that might actually be more interesting. So a number of companies, as they're dealing with these labor shortage issues or very high turnover, they've tried to think about, is there a way they could develop multi-skill training programs or a way to teach uh, an 18 or 20-year-old uh, 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 several jobs and then give them incentives to stay in the factory to, um, uh, to work and, and maybe uh, earn a little bit more money by, by actually having more skills. Um, the problem with that is their production line doesn't really allow for it. Um, it does in garment production. It, it can, especially companies as, as world class as Lumentai, where one operator could learn three or four different machines and then you have a modular system. I'm sure the denim production in Mexico is more of a modular system, uh, more lean than I would think denim production in, in Asia. And, and as a result of that, I think uh, you could make an argument that they've dealt with the structural issues. Now, well, one final comment is that you know a lot of factories are talking about migration out of Guangdong and, and the coastal provinces to inner provinces, uh, which certainly creates a, an opportunity to address those structural issues of, of the labor turnover, because you're dealing with a population that is now living close to home, or at least mm -hmm. closer. And, and so you might be able to address that. The problem I think that we've learned is when they go to Chengdu and Chongqing and other parts of western and northern China, um, uh, the actual local community is increasing prices very considerably. So while factories are thinking it's an opportunity to recruit workers uh, easier and also have a lower labor cost, the reality is is workers actually have very high living costs, much higher than anyone realized. Um, so you shouldn't be surprised to see a cup of noodles at a factory uh, uh, outside of a factory in Chengdu that costs the same as in Shenzhen. And I think that inflation that's happening is creating also some tension within uh, factories in the north and west as they're actually you know, some of the promises of, of a better uh, way of doing things uh, are not really getting fulfilled at this point. Um, so I hope long term the structural issues can be addressed, uh, but I think that's a, that's a really important thing when you understand China. Uh, that migration issue does influence a lot of it, and it's not the same as in Philippines, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Mexico. You don't have that structural issue uh, as much. Can I just, I just ask one quick question? Um, we've heard a lot about the second generation farmers or the second generation um, migrants coming through and a lot of the industrial issues that emerged from that uh, within the, the factories in China over the last three or four years. How, uh, what sort of insights did you get from your survey in this area, the, the generational differences? Well, um, so our survey didn't, didn't really get the generation because we're dealing with the new generation and we're not doing a comparison with the old generation. But the ACFTU and, and a variety of different organizations in China have done in-depth uh, research in this. And what they found is, uh, and, and also what we found is, the average tenure of the current generation is about 10 months in a job. Uh, their parents' generation is about one and a half years in a job average. So people are leaving more regularly. Now, if you try to understand what's the root cause of that, besides the structural issues that I mentioned, I think it's all the things that have been reported. Uh, workers who want better jobs, career advancement, uh, they are more interested to, uh, some of them are interested to go to a big city and, and try it out because they've only had uh, you know, their, their, their life in, in, in terms of a home town or village. Uh, um, so I think that uh, some, some workers are more interested in the excitement of a new location and a new job. Some workers, it is about money and uh, that drives them. Uh, others, it's about career development and advancement. Uh, but one thing is certainly true, uh, workers definitely are, are less loyal today than they were uh, uh, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and I just want to introduce the uh, fourth speaker, is Karen Ferguson. Um, Karen, we're looking at very much China and Asia. Can you give us a more global perspective, and in particular, on the higher levels, the sort of management areas, if you can. Introduce yourself and where you go. Okay, thank you. So, hi everybody, I'm Karen Ferguson, responsible for human resources for Schneider Electric. We're a 22 billion euro company. 
specializing in energy management, which means that we, uh, we do the whole chain. So we research and develop, we manufacture, and we sell our products and solutions to customers to help them save on their energy bills. So for all of that chain, we need good senior leaders, and, and it's a real preoccupation. I've heard people speak about the, the volume of workforce, and what I would say is that that's great. You can put a lot of investment and time in the volume, but if you don't get it right at the top, then probably much of that investment can be wasted. So having good senior leaders is really critical for, for all of our businesses. And the way we try to do that, the way we try to address is, you could say in the way I do manage the supply chain in some respects, because uh, on the one hand, you've got the volume side and the turnover to manage, but for sure, we always have to make decisions on make or buy when people are concerned. And I would say our preference is to do a bit of both. I think it's healthy to have a mix of make or buy strategy in your senior leadership. So we try where we can to, uh, to build our local senior leaders, which is not easy because the growth in this region has been so vast that people have had to skip learning experiences that they may have had in other parts of the world. So that means we have to be quite realistic and quite flexible about our expectations. So when building local leaders, we have to look at the strategic stakes and sometimes to make compromises out of three particular qualities, which one is more critical than the others. And then we can source for that particular competence and build and develop the individual around the other parts that are necessary to do that role well. Um, and then when it comes to, to building talent internally, we've got to make sure that for sure we first of all recruit with the right competencies in mind, but afterwards career planning is crucial and especially for ambitious people, they want to see the movement and they want it fast. And if we won't do it fast for them, they'll find another company where they think they can get it faster. So career planning and helping them have a confidence and a vision of the future is really critical. Added to that some more classic work on leadership development. So making sure that uh, we build all round leaders, because we need to manage for performance in a company, but we need to manage for health as well. So it's all very well having the right results, but to make that sustainable, we need leaders who understand that the cultural aspects are also key, that managing their workforce, motivating and engaging their people is key. And we survey our workforce every quarter, and our senior leaders get a report on the level of engagement and the level of um, recommendation, the net promoter score that our employees would give us. So it's something very tangible for our leaders to work on in, in building the, a strong and motivated team below them. So I think, uh, as I said, flexibility and being realistic are key, and then making sure that we make the right decisions on make or buy. Maybe just to reflect on expats, because I think um, this is a much debated topic. Will we, is it an ambition to eradicate expats because they're costly and so on and so on? Um, no, it's not. I think diversity is what's really critical. When you have a diverse workforce, you have usually a more innovative and a more productive workforce. So it's very healthy to keep a balance of different nationalities. And sometimes those expats come with very valuable years of experience in more mature economies which have been through some of these cycles, so again, we can skip some learning paths. So I think the balance is crucial. And maybe one last comment is we shouldn't, I can't resist the opportunity to say, and looking at this room as well, it kind of confirms it, we shouldn't overlook the gender issue, because when we're looking to be more competitive, when we're looking to have an edge in the talent market, there are many, 50% of the population is women, many are very well educated, and yet we don't tap that source enough. So if our competitors are not tapping that source, then maybe it gives us an advantage to do so. Again, making sure we put the right support, the right development in place, but I think it's another area that we can make uh, more use of than maybe we've done in the past in building senior leaders in our company. I can just add another, just go down one level of depth, not, not sharing the solutions, but sharing the problems, is that, you know, you're right, that 
Um, the leaders that we're working with don't have all the competence. They've grown too fast because there's a vacuum. Local leaders are coming up very fast. Um, and the expectations are to, that's built into that very rapid growth. How do you manage that? I mean, because that is a, is a tricky situation because they don't realize that they don't have the skills. Mm -hmm. Their expectations are overinflated. How do you manage that? Well, well some, some ways that have been successful is to put people on a short-term assignment overseas so that mm -hmm. somebody would go to a country that has a particular expertise or competence in an area. It may only be for three months, but it gives them another perspective. It helps them to open their mind about how they were working <laughs> and how they could work in the future. So short-term assignments are certainly a way we can uh, support this development. And uh, something like assigning a mentor, making sure that, uh, and it could be a mentor in the current workplace, a close colleague, or it could be a mentor again elsewhere that has the right competence to supplement and grow that way. I agree. And, and I think the other thing, just to add to the retention issue, is the wherever we've gone into organizations that leadership, where we've had high turnover of leadership, it's a management issue. If you are genuinely, your managers are genuinely interested in their people and their direct reports, they won't leave. Absolutely. So I think that a lot of it is management skills, you can call it lots of other things. I'm just going to add one more topic and then I'll open it for debate. I'm going to put on the table about ethics and corruption. Um, you know, it's a tricky area, it's an area that we all live in. This, this river that we swim in of normal business practices that are different in Asia to uh, other environments is something that we do have to embrace and work our way through. And it's a tough area. And a lot of it is that the normal business practices, especially when you get into more remote areas, um, is that the way they work is what we would call corrupt. And then it is normal. And so a lot of it is you can't just, you know, you do have to follow through and apply the international standards but there's a lot of education, a lot of communication that has to go through um, to take people on that journey. And it is some of those things because, you know, these people have come from an environment where it is normal to behave in a certain way. In the procurement is that what you do to get a contract is you give a contribution to the person in charge of procurement. That's what you do. This is difficult to break. And one of the things we found is that it's a long journey. It's not a quick fix journey. You've got to maintain your standards, you've got to follow through over time, um, but it is, you, you can drive it out of your uh, organization, into, um, out of your uh, plants, but it does remain an ongoing problem, and it is one I'm sure we've all dealt with. So I think that's just part of what we have to do if we're getting into the human aspects of this whole supply chain area. So, Ladies and gentlemen, that was very fast and very breathless. Thank you very much, my panel. That's great. So, a lot of areas we covered. Um, we're really looking for you to raise issues so that we can respond to your areas of interest. So, over to you. Questions, please. Okay. Can you state your name and company, thank you. My name, my name is Mark Fury from a company called AsiaNet. Um, I've seen through my career, both in consulting and in human resources, um, a, a, a lack of really nailing the issue by KPIs of people performance. 50% uh, of many bonus schemes are uh, assigned to profit. I don't see many where 50% is assigned to people. And in most companies I know, if you haven't got people, you haven't got a company. So, uh, if you're going to get down to the reality of, ma of managing these key issues, it has to be done by line management. It can't be back heeled just to HR. Line managers have to take responsibility, and they have to be measured on that. And I'd be interested to know just how many companies really are judging their line management performance and KPIs on people. Good. Thank you. We're going to take a couple of questions as well. Yeah. Back there. Right at the very back. Yeah, I think you can press Hi, I'm uh, Sunil from Inditex Actually, My question is more um, 
What is your insight on uh, the apparel industry in China? Um, you know, with the manufacturing being very competitive, uh, the labor costs in China going quite high, and the workers in factories are no longer stable, you know, they're no more loyal. How do you see country like Bangladesh being the major hub in garment industry, you know, garment manufacturing in the next five to ten years? Perfect, okay, thank you for that. We'll take one more question, and then we'll answer those questions. Yeah, good morning, people Paul from East Asia. Um, I've got a question especially for Karen. You talked a lot about uh, the way you wanted to set up uh, your team with different nationalities and how you, you thought about grooming and training local people and local management. Um, I'm really interested to see if in your group you have a program for local managers to go back to Europe, work not on a short-term assignment, but on a long-term assignment into understanding better the concept of your business, understanding, learning about the business itself, and then bringing that back to the local uh, communities they work with. And if you don't that, um, how do people integrate? Social life in Europe is very, very different from social life in Asia, as we all know. And based on your experience, what have you seen into so that we can improve it when we send in local managers back to Europe? Okay, thank you very much. We'll take those questions, and then we'll have another round of questions in a minute. Um, so first of all, the, the, the broader question of performance management, KPIs, that whole area. Um, it's, it's an area that is very difficult in terms of um, an Asian environment of where people don't like to be held accountable for a variety of reasons. There is a resistance in this area. I don't know if you'd like to, you'd like to respond to that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see it myself. I think we maybe it comes from the company culture, but our people tell us we are even KPI obsessed. So they would say uh, they don't resist them, they recognize the need for them, but, uh, but they embrace them, I would say, quite well. To come back to the specific point on uh, the human factor within KPIs, I, I totally agree they should be more present, and it's, it's tough to push them through, but uh, today we do have some people related to KPIs in our executive team's bonus um, targets. And because they have them, they very naturally then cascade them down to their line leaders. And it's, I have to say it's helped me as an HR enormously on driving the people agenda. I mentioned before the survey that we do quarterly. When a leader is getting a score for themselves every quarter and, and they know that they will be accountable for that, it really makes them focus on the people agenda. So it does make a difference. And uh, I think building them into short-term plans, but also long-term where you have stock option plans with performance measures in also, then building the people metrics into that would also be a way of building what I call the sustainable enterprise of the future. Yeah, I, I, I must say, I'm finding it a different world. I find that by and large, uh, there is a resistance to, um, uh, to being held accountable. Um, in particular, you know, if I'm a boss, all those people who work for me need to look good. So the, 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 the 360 degree performance management aspects and the, the, everything that goes with that, I find it difficult to, especially as you get further down and into more, more remote areas, um, uh, there is a resistance and it is something that you need to um, work for. It, it, it is not an easy one. The production matrix, which is what you ask for, is easy. But when you get outside that, anything that's more value driven is very hard. Um, it, it, it takes a long time. I think an established international culture is fine. When you're transitioning from local cultures, it takes a long time. Do you have a comment at all on this? Um, I'll explain this like this. Uh, as a smaller company, as we grew up, uh, decisions are being made mostly with the senior person or the owner. So the junior people will feel less accountable. Okay, it's all, the boss has this, I'll do it. So uh, the measurement of KPI of people will be less important. It's more about how do I please the boss or how the situation evolves. Uh, but as we are growing bigger, we are changing the culture where uh, decision has to be, to be pushed to the front, to the people who's really in charge. Uh, so I would say that uh, that will reflect you know, how you measure the financial success and the sharing. Uh, we look at the people turnover. You look at succession planning that we're asking them to submit. Uh, all these things will reflect, and part of those will be the people side. But and are we doing the best? Not yet, but we are looking into it because as we are getting bigger, then 
Um, I think it's part of the process. Okay, good, thank you. So, just to take the next question, which is the question of Bangladesh versus um, other places, I can just reshape that slightly to more South China versus North, uh, North and East China. Um, uh, we are finding a, a series of um, issues that are emerging in terms of relations and things like that. What are the things that have, you know, where do you see this balance over time? Is that, is that maybe the I mean, I'll ask Vaidya because I think he's the one sourcing from Bangladesh. Yeah, you may go, Vaidya. I need to vote it out to Bangladesh because I'm not the China expert because my business is 8% of my business is in China because I can't afford China. So um, that so much to the answer of China. Um, I think also when you look at China, it is not particularly cheaper when you go over in the north. Um, it is you, you find um, still wage levels that are really um, make you struggle to work with and, and to afford governments, be it in China province or be it on, in the Western provinces. So um, I, I don't think that it's only a migration from south to north or to west, northwest uh, issue in China, it's a more broader issue. To, to Bangladesh, um, I do a lot of my business in Bangladesh. Uh, it's, a, it's a great country, I must say. Um, Despite of what many people think about it and say about it, I think we, we get incredible quality out of Bangladesh. You find uh, workers that are very um, motivated. You find factory owners um, that can communicate with you very well. Um, they have a concept in mind. There's, they are very innovative. You find some of the latest automation and machinery in Bangladesh. They are restricted by quantity per order. Minimum order size is an issue in Bangladesh, obviously. And the biggest restriction is infrastructure. When you read the McKinsey report over the next 10 years, McKinsey is saying Bangladesh business, export business in garments, will double, if not triple. And, and we're just looking at the country and we're saying, how? They don't have enough gas today, they don't have enough electricity, they don't have enough roads, and they don't have a deep sea port, and they're still talking about a deep sea port that should have which hasn't happened. So I think Bangladesh is its own little stumbling block. Uh, but from a from the potential of the country, there, there's vast potential in there. Definitely. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll just comment maybe in outside of garments. So I mean, uh, garments. You know, you can go to Bangladesh. You can't take electronics to Bangladesh. You can't do most household goods. You can't go to Southeast Asia for. So it's still a China business, and I think a lot of people are going north. Uh, and uh, I, I think one of, one of the things, and I, I just want to make sure this audience sort of gets this point. I, I think. You know, a lot of people talk about ethical sourcing and compliance and the difference between, say, a country like Bangladesh and Cambodia versus China. I, I, I've been doing this for 20 years, and I'll tell you that a typical Bangladesh factory, a typical Cambodia factory, complies much more closely to the standard than a typical China factory. And many people are surprised by that because they, they always have these rumors about Bangladesh being bad. Now, Bangladesh is still working 80, 90, 100 hours a week, and they always have still the double books that are quite common. Uh, just like China. But the difference is, of course, in China, we're dealing with the structural issues that I mentioned before of wage increases of 15, 20 percent per year, uh, the R&D appreciation, and we're dealing with a culture of compensation which is based on peace rate, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's a very different way of running your factory. In Bangladesh and Southeast Asia and Mexico, there's no peace rate, except for maybe a few factories that make sweaters or something like that. Peace rate is not commonly used, and in China, it is the standard way of compensating people. So I've been in furniture factories where we measure the weld on the product by inches, and we get paid two RMB per inch of weld. Uh, this, is, this is the way that the compensation system is done, which is a great system to motivate and push for higher productivity. It's a horrible system for controlling time and driving efficiency in relation to time. Uh, and it's a horrible system for guaranteeing the minimum wage and overtime wage properly and for managing work hours to a more reasonable level. Um, so I, I, I think so, some of those are the structural issues that I'm sure we can no, answer. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And then just to uh, the third question was um, taking leadership and really developing your leadership out of Asia into Europe for an extended period of time of turning them. I think this is a big shift we've seen. If, if I'd shown you the figures uh, even five years ago, the majority of our expats came from France or US to other countries. And today the balance is much more balanced. And 
So what we encourage is cross-entity mobility. We even have a KPI for it to try and encourage people to move across different businesses within our portfolio or to move between a function to function or to move between country to country. And um, some of our very successful people who are now senior leaders in uh, Asia have spent up to three, four, even five years in assignments overseas. So it's part of this structured career planning. There has to be a clear objective about why you're sending them, what skills you want them to acquire, and what target roles do you have in mind for them when they return. Um, and, but part of that building is very critical because they have role models in senior positions of, of local people in Asia is, is really critical to, to motivate those coming back. If I can just maybe add to that, uh, I have a very simple rule that I apply for localization of uh, roles where you're moving from an expat to a local. And it's a simple rule if you follow it, it's successful, which is the day that the local person steps into the expat role and you localize the position, his performance improves. So it's a performance improvement issue rather than a localization. And if you follow that rule, it raises the bar. So you're not doing it to save money, you're doing it for performance improvement. If you follow that line, you will have successful localization. So just open up now for another quick batch of questions. Okay. Uh, <coughs> hello, I'm Oli Levy from Dragon Sourcing. I'd like to jump the question about your resources. When we talk about expats, usually we have in mind from Asia, because we're in Asia and Europe. But when we try to uh, commute people within Asia, we say something which is a little bit more complex than competences and skills. It's uh, about acceptance of older communities of uh, original people. For example, to have an Indian leadership over a Chinese team in China, it's much more complex to have a Chinese uh, very good skill to be sent to Europe. To have an uh, Indonesian uh, handling uh, Thai teams, or to have African native people being fluent in Chinese, being able to manage a food team. China or Shanghai, that became much more complex than purely uh, career roadmap, skill, performance, and vote. And I find it much more complex today in Asia compared to what we had in Europe when it is behind us 50 years. It's not about gender today it's in Asia because they are having a male female leadership. I think it's quite accepted all around Asia, probably except uh, South Korea and Japan. But the problem would be about the, uh, the race, the origin of the people. How could they integrate a leadership team, which is a different approach? Okay, thank you. The Asian expat issue, which is a good one. Yeah, that is a very good question. Uh, any other questions? Any, any comments or use? Okay. Is that your name and company? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jean Baptiste from HFAC. Uh, I would like to know if you have any idea of which percentage of Chinese labor force is dedicated to textile. And if textile is moving a lot to Southeast Asia, can this solve the labor, what we call shortage, uh, for other industries, such as electronic and consumer goods? Good, thank you. That's a good question. Any more? Any other comments, questions? Okay. Uh, Mathieu from uh, Class Cooling, Freight Forwarding Company. Uh, I have a very quick question, in fact. Uh, I used to, to do my first job here in Hong Kong 12 years ago. It, uh, I was a QC for a toy company, and I was going uh, every day in, uh, in China. And uh, I was always uh, listening about some stories saying that a Chinese factory has a six months memory. That means that they will do a mistake, you are going to correct it, and six months after, they are doing to do the same mistake again. Is it still the case? Is it, and do you see the same thing happening uh, in Indonesia, in Bangladesh? Uh, you are talking about uh, people very innovating there, automation. Is that the same kind of problem today? Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. So let's take those uh, in order. Uh, the first one is um, non-Western <coughs> expats. Um, Asian expats and moving people from uh, Africa into an Asia leadership situation. Who would like to respond to that? Um, yeah. I can talk to that as I'm responsible for the regional offices. We do 
look at that very accurately. Um, it is a problem, and I think the markets here are not as mature when it comes to diversity yet. And there's deep cultural um, uh, differences between, for example, India and China. It's very difficult to have an Indian run a China team or a Chinese run an Indian team. You even have issues in, in Bangladesh, we're using mostly in the management area, you use Indians because the Bangladesh management is not yet mature enough. It's coming, but the market has grown so fast that there's not enough local managers available. And if they are available, they cost you a fortune. So you bring in Indian Indians <coughs> as expats and as close as Bangladeshis and Indians are ethnically, um, there's a big, a big gap between these guys and they, the Bangladeshis don't like to be ruled and run by Indians, same as Pakistanis and Indians. I mean, we all know you don't really need to start talking about that. So there's, there's deep gaps that need to be overcome, but I think they can be overcome by us teaching them, showing them how you deal with diversity. Um, but we need, to, we need to still keep in mind and respect that despite of our view of diversity, those folks who actually do it and run the daily business, they are not yet there. They need more time. Maybe I can just come in and add a little bit to that. You have, there are some Western countries that where you have better expats than others. So you find some people that actually are easier to be expats than others, same in Asia. So we find that there are some Asian countries that actually create very good expats. For example, that is Thailand. And the Thais actually can move from different places and open up in a higher level. Um, whereas uh, maybe Koreans or Japanese may have more difficulty in that environment. So it is, but I think that the problem is not just uh, between countries, I think it's also between cities. You've got Beijing, Shanghai, and, and uh, you know, the Cantonese communities. I mean, you know, you've got deep suspicions and deep issues. I think it's part of this is just, um, mm -hmm. as you say, it's our responsibility over time is to broaden it and to take it. But as I say, you will find that there are some places both individuals and some cultures that can make this easier. Um, but it is a long-term game. Um, moving on to the next one, which is uh, the centers for textiles coming out of China um, and moving into Southeast Asia. And is that going to have an impact on overall labor uh, shortage and uh, you know, uh, the whole uh, labor infrastructure? Will it change it over time? I think we can start with the um, textile side. Um, manufacturing um, for clothing or you know, our, our soft goods, I think uh, the numbers we are seeing is going down uh, because it's much more migratable. You can move those to different countries. But for textile, you mean uh, all those machines that are more uh, capital intensive. It will, it will take longer time to move around. Uh, what we see is the lower value add uh, discount store type of uh, product maybe it will be moved out because they cannot pay, imagine the retail price versus the FOB price, the multiples that they use, they cannot afford it. Uh, but for some of the brands, they can have four, eight times uh, multiples. Um, they can still afford it, they can stay because they want certainty, uh, they want the complexity, uh, and it's already there. And again, what I said, uh, supply chain is the key. Uh, to most of the branded customers. So uh, these are the areas that we're looking at. How, how many people they will be uh, leaving, I, I would not know, but that would be the group of the people leaving, not the textile group. Um, and our difficulty we find is those, some of those people, they prefer to work in their home country, uh, hometown because their hometown already started a, a service industry like a hotel. Uh, they, they can work in a, a, this environment rather than working in a factory environment. So even if the number goes down, how would that number deploy into the electronic side? Then yeah, I, I, I think that there's definitely move into the service industry side. So rather than from one manufacturing to another, I think definitely there. Um, on the question of uh, six month memory, which is the cycle of quality control, and I think that side I think is an interesting one. Uh, I'm going to give this one to you again. Um, so in this area, I think that um, you know you have issues. Issues do arise. Controls are put in place with this high turnover, with this environment. You know how are people maintaining and delivering consistent quality 
China versus other places? Well, I, I think we, we, we talked about a lot about labor turnover, but I mean the turnover is there for management as well. Mm -hmm. We, you know, the typical projects we would work on factories, it's not uncommon to have the HR team turn over uh, in in a year or two, uh, keep people lead. So I think you know, and remember what I said before: how can you actually have a proper HR function if your primary responsibility is recruiting to replace 15% of your workers who leave every month? Uh, so I think that. The systems that, that might be put in place, the SOPs, the procedures, uh, that to ensure that that memory is 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 uh, is held within the company, um, uh, they may be there on paper, but the reality is they're not being implemented uh, uh, when you're dealing with again some of these uh, labor turnovers, uh, particularly at the management level as well. Um, you know, there's uh, a kid in terms of how, how what a great business opportunity it is to actually be an HR recruiter to hire HR people. Uh, because uh, factories are really struggling to get strong HR managers and leaders to help uh, go get away from just the, the recruitment process to more multi-skill training and, and, and really investment in their workforce. Uh, it's, it's difficult. And I think it's a lot of to add to that. Um, I think if you have a factory that has a repetitive cycle of six months, you have a great factory. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it. In, in the QA function who basically complain about people in factories having a reset button that somebody pushes every morning and you start with a, with a blank brain again in the morning. It, it, I think it's one of the frustrating issues when you look at our industry, how many QAs we have driving through Asia and how much money we're spending on people, planes, trains, automobiles to do nothing but to control a factory to do what they've been paid to do. It's a big frustration. I'm trying to convert some of my largest suppliers. A large supplier for me would be a guy I do about a million pair of jeans a month with. So sizable factories. I'm trying to convert those guys into CFA certified field audits so that they self-audit themselves. It is not possible. The people themselves say, please do it. Keep on controlling me because I don't trust you that my staff is. <laughs> when you really poke into an infrastructure of a facility, and Tony, bear with me, I'm sure that your facilities are different. <laughs> but if you really look into the infrastructure, the QA infrastructure, when I'm in a factory and you ask at the end of the line, can I see the report? There's somebody swinging a measurement tape right by the end. Then you say, can I see your report? Then they takes a little while, a little confusion, and some piece of paper is being produced, and then you say, okay, what do you do with this piece of paper? Where does this now go? And then there's some massive confusion. Mm -hmm. And then they say, oh, <laughs> after 10 minutes, they say, oh, we bring this later onto the showroom, uh, we show you. You've never heard of it again. So I think <laughs> QA is, is one of the areas of great frustration where we really need to put more, much more infrastructure. Yeah, please. Um, Agree. <laughs> I think uh, from our perspective, I just do a little bit of sharing. Um, just a few weeks ago, I went into an incident with one of my QA person uh, with a company that we're changing, and I asked them with the production team, what's the role of the QA? They said, ensure quality is right. I said, wrong. Okay? It's the management who will ensure the quality is right. So uh, it's a joint effort of the QA team and the management. So the culture of the quality concept in mind plays a very critical role to make sure the factory can chunk up the right product. At the same time, it's accountability. And how do we align the management team and the ownership? Imagine you work for a company as a factory manager or a QA manager, but you see that as a job. You don't see the reputation risk of the company, of the business. Imagine that if we supply to uh, Vite. And I don't care because I want to make sure this shipment goes, goes to him and then I collect the money. But I won't care whether I get the next order. This, this is a problem. Or the long term yeah. reputation, are we going to do more business with him? So um, that is the owner's mindset. But that may not be the executive's or the manager's mindset. So what we in our company, we're trying to make sure is we are deploying the long term uh, ownership concept with the executive. We are trying to make sure the quality transparencies. Uh, into it so that we can work with them. You know, we talk about the QA report. Um, we will also tell our customer that, you know, we did not do a good job. 
But I, we, we know that we are not the worst, so they also have some patience with us. But we are trying to work together maybe throughout a year to two to improve. Are we there yet? Not totally, but uh, I think this is important as we are changing. So thank you. So let's sort of finish up. <coughs> What Sonia is intimating is something that we've seen quite a lot of, which is the beginnings of um, Chinese or Asian characteristics going through organizations that are moving to longer term sharing of uh, direction and goals. Um, and there is something we can learn uh, that actually comes, it's not just out of you know, the US or Europe, but there are things of, of, that come from initially from family companies but there are some very good Asian companies with good cultures that decided to come through. Um, thank you very much. I'm sorry, it's been a very wide-ranging area, so I'll just leave you with the final thought, is that you do have a lot of people that are affected and involved in your supply chain. You're talking about tens of thousands of people. They're all individuals. Don't treat them as mass. Treat them as individuals. Um, think about them as individuals. Each one of them has got two, three, four, five dependents. Um, think about them and their families, and if you actually think through that area, you will actually start to contact and get an engagement, whether it's safety, whether it's productivity, whether whatever is there. Um, try not to get caught with the large numbers that we all deal with. They are large numbers of individuals. And if you really work through that and follow that through, it changes it, because that is the power of your organization. And if you invest in your people, it actually gives you a competitive edge. So it is something, we just had a CEO survey at PricewaterhouseCoopers where we worked through the top CEOs of the world and the whole, uh, like 62% of them said their major area is to do with leadership, is to do with the human characteristics of their organizations. So it is not something anymore that's left to HR. It is now your responsibility, it is line responsibility, you're running it, HR says it's help you, but it is your responsibility, and if you manage your people well, your leadership and your workers and your relationships with your suppliers, um, you can create a competitive company. I think Karen here an example of that, I think Sunny is also an example of that. Engaging with your people does lead to good company. So, leave with that in mind, and thank you very much. Thank you once again to our esteemed panel.